79-year-old Iva Tice had a lot on her mind. Her husband had fallen ill and she was making sure everything was taken care of at home. But each afternoon, she'd make the short drive to the hospital and spend hours sitting with her husband, hoping he would pull through. Then one rainy Wednesday, she didn't show up. Calls to her home went unanswered, as did knocks on the door from neighbors. Worried about her safety, the Allentown police were called to conduct a welfare check. They found the house quiet, dark, the shades all drawn but for one small window, which also happened to be unlocked. Upon entering the home, a patrolman made a horrifying discovery. Someone had brutally murdered the elderly woman in her own bed. Initially, police believed it had likely been a robbery gone wrong, with Iva stumbling upon the intruder during the night. However, as evidence was gathered, there were many contradictions. Dresser drawers had been ransacked and dumped out, but cash was left lying in the open. What began as an investigation into a random home invasion and robbery slowly began developing into something different. Had Iva been killed when she stumbled upon an unknown intruder in the process of a robbery, or was it all staged to look like a robbery by someone who had specifically targeted the elderly woman, perhaps even someone she would have recognized? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 169, The Murder of Iva Tice. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine a truly brutal and violent murder which has remained unsolved for nearly 40 years. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Sweet, kind, respected, and loved, Iva Tice was a mother, grandmother, wife, and daughter. Then one quiet November night, while her husband was in the hospital, an intruder entered her home and she was brutally killed. The question remains to this day. Was this a random robbery gone wrong, or was murder always the intent? This is episode 169, The Murder of Iva Tice. Iva Idella Dreisbach was born on Saturday, November 30th, 1901 in Lehighton, Pennsylvania, to parents Joseph and Joanna. Iva was the fourth-born child, having two older sisters and an older brother. Over the course of the next ten years, the family would grow by four more, with three younger brothers and a sister, bringing the sibling count to seven. Iva was raised in Big Creek, in the township of Franklin, Carbon County. Her father, Joseph, operated a truck farm in Big Creek, growing crops for sale at local and faraway markets. Being raised on the farm was both a tough and rewarding life for the youngster, who had to assist in tending to the fields and the upkeep of the home. From a young age, Iva developed a reputation for being polite, kind, and gracious. Working on the farm taught her the value of hard work and dedication, and while rural living at the turn of the century was far from comfortable, she took great pride in working together with her family. Iva often dreamed of a world beyond the family farm, with trips into town being something she treasured, though her dreams would carry her off to faraway places, as she spent much of her youth constructing lists of all the places she hoped to see someday, from all across the United States to Europe and beyond. On Saturday, June 16, 1923, Iva, 21 at the time, married 25-year-old Clifford Kindred, Shortly after the ceremony, the newlyweds moved from the Lehighton area over to Allentown, where Iva would live throughout the rest of her life. The couple began building their family that same year, welcoming their first child, a daughter named Doris. 
Ivo was thrilled to be a mother and was focused on ensuring her children had a loving and good life. Clifford worked various jobs until he was hired on by the Ritter and Yost Motor Company as a car salesman, and the young family moved into a house on Cumberland Street. Less than two years later, on January 4th, 1925, Iva's father, Joseph, passed away at the age of 54. It was a difficult time for Iva, and especially her mother, who remained at the family home where Iva's younger siblings, Paul and Lee, were just 16 and 15. Iva remained at home, raising their daughter, and in May of 1927, the family welcomed their second child, a son named Clifford. Over the course of the next decade, Iva would experience her shares of ups and downs, as the Great Depression hit the country and World War II exploded in Europe. In 1941, her mother Joanna passed away, and tragically, just three years later, her daughter Doris died at the age of 20. According to the Morning Call newspaper, Doris had been ill for some time and passed away at her home. Iva and her family would move across town, purchasing a row house on Turner Street where she would continue to raise Clifford. Once the boy had become the age to look after himself and was in school, Iva turned her attention towards finding a job to both keep herself busy and contribute to the household. Never much the type to just sit around, Iva found employment at Hesse's department store being hired on to work at the 9th and Hamilton Street location. Beginning as an employee in dresses, coats, and suits, she'd work her way through different departments over the years before finally running the French Room, which specialized in fancy and luxurious dresses from the best designers. Throughout the years, Iva would see her dreams of travel fulfilled as she passed through and visited almost every state in the Union. Her younger brother, Lee, migrated out to California where he opened a restaurant, and Iva visited on several occasions, always loving being out on the road and seeing the different landscapes. Outside of work and travel, Iva was highly involved with the Ebenezer United Brethren Church where her husband served on the council. Sadly, in November of 1956, after 23 years of marriage, Iva's husband passed away at the age of 58 after being ill for some time. Following the funeral, he was laid to rest in Highland Memorial Park Cemetery. By the age of 55, Iva had already buried her parents, a sister, a daughter, and now her husband. For the next 14 years, Iva focused on building her life as the sole income earner. She continued working at Hess's and would work there for another 25 years, earning a reputation with locals as trustworthy, honest, and caring. In 1960, when she was 59, Iva got to live out another of her life's dreams when she traveled to Europe. According to a 1966 interview in The Morning Call, she visited 10 countries and especially enjoyed festivals in Germany. Back at home, she was a grandmother now, helping her son raise their three children. In her free time, Iva developed a fondness for art and began creating her own oil paintings, which have been described as quite good. Iva continued living at the Turner Street Row House until 1970, when at the age of 68, she married for the second time to 78-year-old Herbert W. Tice, a widower who had previously lived in California and worked as the vice president of an electric company. Together, the new couple moved into a green and white ranch-style home on North Main Street in Allentown, the very home where Iva would be murdered just over 10 years later. Between 1970 and 75, Iva would attend funerals for two of her brothers and one of her sisters, leaving her with a son, two stepsons through Herbert, one sister, and two brothers. In November of 1981, Iva was 79 years old with her 80th birthday coming up, but she'd never get the chance to celebrate it. On Tuesday, November 10th, Herbert suffered a stroke and was rushed to the hospital. While in the hospital, it was determined that in addition to the detrimental effects of the stroke, Herbert was developing and suffering from double pneumonia. Over the course of the next week, Iva was staying at their North Main Street home by herself, taking care of the house and bills, and visiting Herbert every afternoon for several hours at a time. The last time anyone saw Iva alive was a week later on Tuesday, November 17th. According to the morning call, a neighbor visited Iva at home that afternoon. 
At approximately 3.30 p.m., the neighbor left as Iva was planning to go to the hospital. Strangely, it appears Iva never made it to the hospital that day, as neither friends, family, nor neighbors saw or spoke with her after 3.30. When Iva failed to arrive for her normal visit, hospital staff called the house but received no answer. When no one could get in touch with her, Clifford was notified, and at the time, family and friends began placing multiple calls, but none of these were answered either. Iva's son Clifford contacted neighbors and asked them to check in on his mother, but no one could get an answer at her front door, nor did they report seeing any movement inside the house. On the morning of Thursday, November 19th, a call came in to the Allentown Police Department requesting that an officer conduct a welfare check on the 79-year-old. Patrolman Richard Boyer answered the radio call and began driving towards North Main Street, a short drive from his location. According to Boyer, when he arrived at the house, it was quiet, with the Venetian blinds closed over each window, making it difficult for him to get a look inside. On the front step, the officer noted two newspapers lying there, one dated Wednesday the 18th and the other Thursday the 19th. It was highly unlike Iva to leave the newspapers out according to neighbors, noting that she often woke up early and brought the papers in as part of her normal morning routine. Walking around the house, Officer Boyer didn't initially see anything which indicated that a crime might have occurred. The house appeared quiet and secure. It was laid out in a slight L-shape, with the long part running north to south. A small bump-out area, noted as being a bedroom, juts out from the front of the structure with several full-size windows facing the streets and two smaller rectangular windows running along the sides. The garage is in the rear of the home with the driveway running along the north side of the house. As Officer Boyer came up from the rear, he passed the garage and a series of windows. Lying in the grass, he found the small rectangular frame which appeared to have been removed from one of the windows. Reaching up, Officer Boyer checked the window and found it to be the only one which wasn't locked from the inside. The window itself is located higher up than the other windows of the house, with the sill being noted as being approximately five feet from the ground, and it opened horizontally rather than vertically. Concerned, Officer Boyer slid the window open and called out for Iva, but received no response. Boyer then decided to enter the home through the window lifting himself up and squeezing through the small space, he found himself in a dark bedroom. Once Boyer pulled out his flashlight and moved it around the room, he made the grisly discovery. Iva was lying on her bed in her nightgown, and there was blood everywhere. The officer quickly determined that Iva was deceased and proceeded through the home, exiting out the front door back to his cruiser. Following his call for additional units and detectives, Boyer secured the scene, ensuring that no one entered the home until investigators arrived. The time was 12.40 p.m. Investigators arriving on the scene entered the bedroom and found the horrifying murder. Allentown Police Chief Arthur Allender later told the morning call that it was, quote, one of the most horrible things I've ever seen in my 28 years on the force, end quote. Due to the condition Iva was found in, no determination could be made about her cause of death until an autopsy could be conducted. Investigators began going through the home in search of any evidence they could find, but much of what they did discover only caused confusion. Initially, the belief was that an intruder had entered the home via the same window Officer Boya had used to gain entry, but detectives noted there was no damage to the window, the locking mechanism, the window frame, or the screen. At the time, there was no way of knowing for certain if the window had actually been locked from the inside, and it was considered possible that the killer had popped the screen out and simply slid the glass panel to the side. However, there was something about the window which made investigators speculate about the possibility that more than one person might have been involved. The sill of the window was five feet above the ground, but police found no shoe scuff marks or dirt on the white stucco wall beneath it. While it was possible someone could have gotten through the small opening without needing the leverage of the wall to support them, detectives wondered if maybe a second person had been there, giving them a boost. The home itself was dark. The only light on at the time of the murder was a small nightlight in a bathroom which adjoined the bedroom. However, 
much of the home was undisturbed, which suggested the killer had either had a flashlight, had entered the home during daylight, or perhaps was familiar with the layout. On the bedroom floor, not far from Iva's body, was a fireplace poker. It was later determined that the poker had been removed from a stand of fireplace utensils in the home's living room. That first day, no one was sure what exactly the poker was doing there, whether Iva had gotten it to defend herself, or if the killer had wielded it. But due to the lack of blood, it was considered unlikely to be the murder weapon. As the afternoon shifted to evening, investigators made the decision to seal the house shut. Chief Allender contacted the Pennsylvania State Police and arranged to have the crime lab go through the home the next day, along with detectives from both the Homicide Division as well as the Identification Bureau. Iva's body was removed from the home and transferred to Sacred Heart Hospital just four miles away. In initial statements to the media, Lehigh County District Attorney William Platt stated that police did not, at that time, have any suspects, though they believe robbery may have been a motive with Iva surprising her killer during the night. D.A. Platt noted there hadn't been any robberies in the area in the previous months, but they wouldn't know more until they could go through the scene and see the results of the autopsy. When Clifford was contacted by investigators, he was absolutely devastated by the news of his mother's murder. At the time, he couldn't understand how someone could viciously murder such a kind and sweet older woman who didn't really have a means through which to defend herself. Years later, Clifford recalled a police sergeant telling him that they would catch the guy fast and easy. That was the thought process at the time, that whoever had done this wouldn't get away, and everyone from Chief Allender to D.A. Platt felt they'd make an arrest within days. Unfortunately, the answers everyone sought would turn out to be much harder to uncover than they had imagined. On Friday, November 20th, detectives in the state crime lab arrived at the North Main Street home in the early morning hours to begin their search. At the same time, Other detectives began canvassing the neighborhood to track down anyone who might have seen or heard anything in the time between Tuesday, when Iva was last seen, and Thursday, when her body was found. That afternoon, forensic pathologist Dr. Isidore Mialakis would conduct the autopsy at Sacred Heart. One of the first people detectives spoke with was a newspaper carrier who had been delivering to Iva's home for several years. This man, who requested he not be named publicly, had been to the home making deliveries on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday mornings that week. He'd also come to the house on Wednesday night between 7 and 8 p.m. to collect payment for that month's deliveries, but had received no answer when he knocked on the door. However, it was on Thursday morning that he first noticed something that stood out to him. According to the carrier, whenever he delivered the papers, he didn't just toss them on the front lawn. He'd walk up to the front door open the glass storm door, and leave the paper tucked between the inner and outer door. However, when he delivered the paper on Thursday, he found Wednesday's paper lying on the front porch, as though someone had opened the storm door, allowing the paper to fall out. Much like many of the neighbors, friends, and family, the carrier's story matched up, with Iva having not been seen after Tuesday afternoon. With her Wednesday paper still present, it seemed most likely that the murder occurred sometime between 3.30 p.m. Tuesday the 17th and 7 a.m. on Thursday the 19th. It was theorized at the time that the paper on the front porch may have come as a result of the killer exiting the home via the front door after the crime. As the killer left, he would have opened the outer door letting the paper drop onto the porch before pulling the locked inner door shut behind him. At the hospital, Dr. Mialakis completed his forensic examination. According to the autopsy, the cause of death was determined to have been stabbing. District Attorney Platt later told the morning call, quote, death was the result of multiple stab and cut wounds, mainly around the neck, end quote. When interviewed years later, Clifford stated that investigators had told him that his mother had been stabbed approximately 40 times, with what has been described as a large carving knife. In addition to determining the cause of death, the autopsy showed defensive wounds on Iva's palm, suggesting that she'd fought back or attempted to resist her attacker. The autopsy report also stated that there were no signs of sexual assault. 
This new information brought another layer into the crime lab's work at Iva's home, as detectives hoped to determine whether or not the knife used had actually been taken from her own kitchen. Back at the house on North Main Street, investigators made several discoveries which added confusion to the case. Firstly, it was determined that while the fire poker had not been the murder weapon, it had been used by the killer to strike Iva on the head at least once due to head wounds noted in the autopsy. A full sweep of the home failed to turn up the murder weapon, suggesting that the killer had taken it with him. The scene itself had several strange details. In the bedroom, it appeared that the assailant had pulled the drawers out of Iva's bureau and dumped the contents on the floor. This contributed to the belief that the murder had been conducted during the course of a robbery. However, other details contradicted that. According to investigators, there was cash present in the home, which had not been touched, and some of it was lying out in plain view. Among this money was several dollars in the dining room, which Iva had apparently placed there to pay the newspaper carrier. In the TV room, police found Iva's purse, which had $50 in it. Speaking of Iva's purse, another strange piece of evidence left investigators confused. Lying on the bedroom floor not far from where the fire poker had been found was what appeared to be the strap of a purse torn off during a struggle. However, Iva's purse in the living room wasn't missing a strap. Investigators attempted to determine whether or not Iva may have owned a second purse, but neither friends or family could confirm that. Police couldn't figure out if perhaps there had been a strap in one of the drawers that had been dumped out, and that's how it ended up on the bedroom floor. The only other evidence mentioned by investigators related to the bathroom, which adjoined the bedroom. According to detectives, they located bloodstains in the sink, which are believed to have been left by the killer. It was considered likely that after committing the murder, given the massive quantity of blood spilled, the assailant may have entered the bathroom to wash his hands. There was no blood present on any of the washcloths, though whether or not the suspect might have taken one with him is unknown. By this point, police weren't sure what exactly they were looking at. While the crime could have been random, a robbery gone wrong, the house hadn't been ransacked outside of the bedroom. So whether or not this was random or perhaps committed by someone looking for something specific was unknown. There was, of course, the possibility that the intent had always been murder and that dumping out the drawers and knocking out the window screen was a weak attempt to make it appear as a robbery gone wrong. In order for robbery to be supported, They needed evidence that items had been taken, but there were only four items which were unaccounted for during the original search. Reportedly, three pieces of jewelry hadn't been found in the home and were known to belong to Iva. These items were described as two antique rings and one newer diamond ring. The only other item believed to have been missing was Herbert's wallet. Staff at the hospital told investigators that he didn't have his wallet on him when he was admitted but the wallet wasn't present in the home either. Unfortunately, due to Herbert's stroke, he didn't possess the cognitive function to fully understand questions which were being asked of him, and doctors advised he wouldn't be able to answer even if he did understand, so, at least for their time, Herbert wasn't questioned. A friend of Iva and Herbert's, Reverend Walter Boyer, later told the morning call that Herbert had not been told about Iva's murder due to how seriously ill he was, and they didn't plan on telling him any time soon unless he started asking questions about where his wife was. A funeral was held for Iva on Tuesday, November 24th at Stephen's Funeral Home in Allentown. She was laid to rest in Highland Memorial Park Cemetery, not far from her parents and her first husband. At the time, investigators continued to state in the media that they believed this was a case they would solve quickly but as time progressed, it seemed the answers were only moving further away. In mid-December, three weeks after the murder, District Attorney Platt spoke to the morning call and said that based on information discovered at the scene, they were optimistic about breaking the case, stating, quote, I have every reason to believe the case will be solved, end quote. While Platt seemed sure in his statement, he also confirmed that police had yet to identify any suspects. Around this same time, it was reported that a large carving knife, similar to the one believed to have killed Iva, was found in the town of Salisbury, approximately 10 miles to the southeast of Allentown. 
When asked about the possibility that this could have been the knife used in the murder, District Attorney Platt wouldn't give any comment, and investigators would neither confirm where it had been found nor when it had been found. The investigation into Iva's murder grew quiet by the end of the year. There were no more interviews or discussions about how things were progressing. It wouldn't be until April, some five months later, that police discussed the case again. Detectives told reporters that they were following definitive leads in the murder and that their investigation had taken them out of state. Later, Police Chief Carson Gable told the morning call that investigators had made trips to New York following up on leads, though he wouldn't expand on what the leads were, nor who or what they were looking for in New York. In regard to the jewelry which had been reported missing from the home, Detectives Captain Gerald Monahan Jr. told the call that the items had actually been located. Following Iva's death, the contents of the home were inventoried for auction, and all three rings had been found. When asked for an update about the knife found in Salisbury, Monahan replied that the crime lab had examined the weapon and, quote, there was nothing on the knife to indicate it had been used in the murder, end quote. Seven months later in November, one year after Iva's murder, the case had apparently hit a wall. District Attorney Platt told reporters that there were not many avenues left to pursue in the investigation, though he wouldn't comment about any new evidence or potential suspects. Sadly, Iva's name slowly faded from the papers and television news reports as, a year later, little progress appeared to have been made. To this day, Iva's murder remains the only unsolved homicide in Allentown for the year of 1981. There wouldn't be any further discussion of the murder until more than 30 years later. In January of 2015, the Allentown Police Department had amassed an impressive record of solving more than 90% of all homicides committed. For the first time, they decided to form a cold case unit which would go back and examine several cases from the previous 40 years, and Iva's case was on that list. The unit was made up of Sergeant Ray Saney and two veteran detectives, Eric Landis and Stephen Milkvotis. Their goal was to re-examine evidence, conduct interviews with friends and family who were still living, and to question anyone who had been spoken to during the original investigation. Unfortunately. There was no mention of any potential DNA evidence in Iva's case, and following their announcement of the cold case unit, there doesn't appear to have been any major progress made on her case. 79-year-old Iva Tice was brutally murdered in her bedroom sometime between the afternoon of Tuesday, November 17th and Thursday, November 19th, 1981 in Allentown, Pennsylvania. This November will mark 40 years since the crime was committed, and to date, no suspects or persons of interest have ever been named. In fact, no theories about what might have happened or who might have had a reason to want to harm Iva have been mentioned by investigators outside of the initial belief that it was a robbery gone wrong. Iva's son, Clifford, is 94 years old and continues to hope that someday his mother's killer will be brought to justice. He spoke to the morning call in 2015 following the creation of the cold case unit. When asked about all the time that had passed without an answer, he replied, quote, I've given up on it. I was very disappointed that more action wasn't taken at the time. We went to the length of hiring one of those mental prognosticators. It was just this out of the world thing as far as I was concerned, but we were just desperate. She was viciously attacked. She was stabbed in the chest over 40 times, I was told. It wasn't just a case in the past. It was my mother. A senseless murder rocks a neighborhood and shatters a family. Investigators believe they'll break the case quickly, track down the suspect, and make an arrest. They're so certain they even tell the family they'll find the guy in no time. Yet, what at first appeared to be a robbery gone wrong begins to change as each piece of evidence found only functions to cloud the image. Leads start to fade, the heat of the case cools, and now, 40 years later, the same questions that were asked that cold November afternoon remain unanswered. 
Iva Tice was a sweet, kind woman who was respected by her neighbors and loved by her family. For nearly 40 years, she has laid beneath a simple stone in a quiet cemetery while a killer has been free to walk the streets and perhaps kill again. Unfortunately, there's never been much revealed to explain why investigators were so confident in those early weeks. There's never been a mention of fingerprints or DNA, and what evidence is known does little to shed light on who may have been responsible for this hideous and brutal crime. Throughout the years, there have only ever been two theories in consideration. That Iva was killed at random by an intruder looking to rob her house, or by someone she may have known who killed her to escape being identified. Being that this is a case where only a small amount of information has ever been released, I think it's best to go through it all, examining each theory through the lens of the known evidence. The first thing that struck me when digging into this case was the time frame in which the crime occurred. Iva and her husband Herbert had lived together in the Green and White House on North Main Street for just over 10 years. There had been no robberies in the neighborhood for months, and there were no robberies in the area for a while after. I guess the question you'd first have to ask is, of all the other homes on that street, why did the suspect choose that house? Is it mere coincidence that this crime was committed during a time where Herbert was in the hospital, leaving Iva alone in the house? Or is it possible the assailant knew that she was by herself? Let's take a look at it from both angles. Some of the evidence fits with the random theory. The fact that the killer apparently didn't bring a weapon with him and instead used items found in the house, first the fireplace poker and then a knife. That would seemingly dismiss the possibility of premeditation as, if you were going to enter the home with the full intent to commit murder, you'd likely have brought along your own weapons or restraints. If this person was entering only to rob the house and didn't plan on encountering Iva, then maybe that makes a little more sense, the murder itself being secondary to the initial plan. The problem for me, however, when it comes to random, is the manner in which Iva was killed. Had she been struck over the head with the poker and then stabbed a few times or beaten with the poker itself, it might fit. But knowing she was stabbed approximately 40 times suggests something more personal. Think about how things would have developed. Iva wakes up. Maybe she shouts asking who it is or threatens to call the police. She tries to get out of the bedroom, but the assailant fights with her. During the struggle, she's punched or thrown down in a way where she can't get up. Bear in mind, she's 79. At this point, the assailant exits the room and goes searching for some kind of a weapon. Maybe he wants to threaten her so she'll tell him about the location of valuables. Maybe he plans to knock her unconscious or restrain her further. The item he returns with is the poker from the fireplace. We never get a full description of it, but in general, pokers run between 25 and 40 inches long and can weigh anywhere from 1 to 3 pounds. Most of the ones you're going to find in a home such as Iva's are going to be on the lighter side of the scale. It doesn't sound as though Iva was bludgeoned. The way police have described the scene, it appears that she was struck on the head no more than once or possibly twice, which likely left her unconscious or temporarily incapacitated. Now, if the intruder was there only at random to rob the house, he'd be faced with a few different options. He could have decided in that moment to get out, run out the front door, climb back out the window, whatever it took. Or he could have chosen to begin looking for money and valuables while Iva was out of it, maybe even restraining her in some way so that if she came around, she couldn't get to the phone or get in the way. It appears here, though, the killer did neither. Instead, he walked into the kitchen, grabbed a large carving knife, came back to the bedroom, and began stabbing. Being that the autopsy showed the wounds all focused in and around the upper chest and neck area, that suggests that she wasn't struggling or moving much during this period of time. Usually if someone is repeatedly stabbed while in the process of trying to get away or fighting, the pattern of the wounds is going to be more widespread. I find it difficult to believe that someone whose only plan was to rob the house is also the same type of person who's going to stab an incapacitated elderly woman 40 times. It's overkill, it's vicious, it's brutal, and it seems personal and anger-driven. Stabbings are generally considered more personal as it is, to be that up close to the victim, but 40 stabs to a victim who can't defend herself is beyond the pale. Not to mention, if murder were the intent, the fire poker likely could have achieved that goal with successive blows. The fire poker itself raises several questions, though. 
It's never been determined if it truly was the killer who brought the poker into the bedroom to wield as a weapon, or if maybe startled awake, Iva grabbed the poker in hopes of defending herself. While the brutality of the stabbing surely shows that the killer wasn't planning on leaving her alive, there's a curiosity about it. If murder had been the plan all along, why hadn't the killer brought the weapon with him instead of using one that he had to find in the house? I've always wondered if the killer knew Ivo was home that night or if once he saw her, he decided she had to be killed. If this were truly just a random robbery, you'd think striking her with the poker would have given him enough time to get away without needing to kill her. But if she had recognized him, then he may have decided she couldn't be allowed to live to tell the police who he is. The knife and the fire poker aren't the only pieces of this puzzle which are confusing. Entry into the home has been debated. Did the killer squeeze through that small window after removing the screen, or had he been waiting for Iva to open the front door, forcing his way in when she went for the morning paper? There's really no way to be sure. If it happened that way, then the killer might have been able to grab the fire poker on the way through the living room towards the bedroom. However, being that the primary location where evidence of a struggle was found is in the bedroom itself, it seems more likely the window was the point of entrance, with the front door being where the killer exited. In terms of this potentially being a robbery gone wrong, there's two major issues. Firstly, the three pieces of jewelry originally reported as being missing were later found during preparations for the auction. I should note, though, that 2015 articles about the cold case unit repeated that jewelry had been stolen. There's no specification given as to whether this refers to the original three rings or maybe different items. That leaves only Herbert's wallet as the one item which has never been recovered. It seems a bit strange to break into a house and steal only a wallet, especially when Iva's wallet holding $50 cash was left behind. The only place in the home where it seems the killer looked for anything was in the bedroom, where he apparently pulled out the drawers of her dresser and dumped them on the floor. Iva and Herbert were both older folks who had lived through the Great Depression. In many instances, people of that age, including my own grandparents, had a hesitancy to trust banks and often hid large sums of money in their homes. Was it possible Iva and Herbert had cash hidden in the dresser drawers and that was always the target of the killer's search? We really have no way of knowing. There is, of course, the possibility that the drawers were dumped to make this look like a robbery and the killer either got freaked out after the murder and chose to leave without ransacking the rest of the home, or maybe there was some specific item he believed was in those drawers. But would a random person know about something that might be in there, or would it have to be someone who knew either Iva, Herbert, or another family member? I've spent a lot of time trying to determine the order in which everything occurred. Based on the fact that the police noted blood was found in the bathroom sink, but they never mention blood being found on the bureau drawers or any of the items dumped out, the order would seem to be that once the killer gained entry, he struggled with Iva. Following the struggle, or in the midst of it, the killer got the fire poker and struck her, temporarily incapacitating her. From that point, it seems like the killer dumped out the drawers and was in the early stages of the robbery when the killing took place. It's entirely possible this person began the search, heard Iva stirring, and decided to kill her. It's also possible that Iva said something to the killer like, I know who you are, or you're going to go to jail, something that made him angry or freaked him out enough to begin stabbing her. However, since the stab wounds were all in the same small tight cluster, it seems more likely that Iva, if she was conscious, wasn't moving much. I do think it's worth noting that police theorized that maybe more than one person had been involved, and were that the case, maybe one person held her down while the other did the murder. The bed was described as being in disarray, as though Iva had been asleep and then there had been a large struggle moving the blankets and sheets around. It's entirely possible it was the killer himself who purposefully woke Iva, maybe getting into the house, grabbing the fire poker, and then waking her to demand the location of money, jewelry, or something else. And at the time she was awakened, all of that struggling began. There doesn't seem to be any evidence suggesting Iva ever left the bedroom that night. The last time Iva was seen alive was around 3.30 on Tuesday afternoon. The newspaper carrier came to collect a bill between 7 and 8 p.m. on Wednesday, but no one answered when he knocked. 
We know Iva had money laid out in the dining room to pay him with, so why wasn't she answering? That would mean the crime would have had to have occurred in a window of time between 10 p.m. Tuesday and 7 or 8 p.m. Thursday. The Wednesday paper was delivered and tucked between the inner and outer front doors. It was found lying on the front porch on Thursday morning when the carrier arrived to deliver that day's paper. For a long time, it's been suggested that the killer left through the front door, and that's why the paper fell onto the porch. But if neighbors did come by knocking to check on Iva at any time after Wednesday morning, they could have knocked the papers loose as well. To me, it takes a special kind of psychopath to stab an incapacitated elderly woman 40 times in the neck and upper chest. If this were someone who typically just did robberies, that's a hell of a leap to make. I think killing Iva and then taking the time to wash your hands in the sink also suggests a certain level of cold-bloodedness tied in with the consciousness of not wanting to leave blood trails through the house. Stabbing someone is both a physically tiring as well as dangerous endeavor. Many killers who use knives were later captured through DNA because their hands would slip off the handle due to the slick nature of blood, cutting their own hand on the blade. Did the killer go in and wash his hands of Iva's blood or to check out a cut he may have gotten during the process? Police noted there was no blood on the towels in the bathroom, but I wouldn't be surprised if the killer took a washcloth out of the house, wrapping his hand in it before he left. So could I see this being the result of a completely random robbery? Sure, depending on who the assailant was, what drugs they could have been on at the time, how desperate they were, you never really know what someone might be capable of once adrenaline, fear, and anger kick in. At the same time, it's very difficult for me to believe that after killing Iva, the suspect didn't try to take things from the house. You're already in there. She's not getting back up. So why the urgency to leave? Sure, maybe they're freaking out, but here you've got to draw a line. Is this a killer who's calm and collected enough to walk into the kitchen, grab the knife, stab her 40 times, and then wash his hands? Or is he the kind who's going to be so scared and worried after the murder that he needs to abandon the entire plan and run away? Now, on the flip side, could I see this being a murder where Iva was for some reason specifically targeted? Yes. This has never felt like a robbery gone wrong to me. It's never felt like someone looking for money or jewelry who found himself confronted by a 79-year-old woman and thought stabbing her 40 times was the best option. You don't have to stab someone that many times unless you want to make sure they're dead or you're really pissed off. A robber is going to want to get away, not stick around longer and make the crime worse. And if he was the type, I find it hard to believe he isn't going to take something to make it worthwhile. Then again, there's a big difference between what an experienced robber might do versus, say, a teenager or someone with less experience. One piece of the case that's always stuck out in my mind is the detectives traveling. In multiple articles, the district attorney as well as the police chief mentioned that investigators had gone to New York following up on leads. This could obviously just be based on tips they'd received and little else, but there is a New York connection in this case. I'm not going to go deep into it because police have never specifically brought up any names, and I'm not a big fan of the type of people who like to name potential suspects and throw around accusations without any solid foundation. But there is one person in Iva's family who at the time was living in New York, and it wasn't someone she was related to by blood. If this was a targeted murder, could it have had anything to do with the fact that Herbert was in the hospital with a life-threatening illness? I think it's worth noting that as his spouse and by Pennsylvania law, if Herbert didn't have a will, Iva would have automatically inherited half of his estate. Without her there, it equally gets split between his children and descendants from his first marriage. It doesn't necessarily tie into the murder, and obviously it's speculative at best, but whenever there's money involved, things always become more complicated. So what do you think? Was this a random robbery that became a brutal and savage murder? Or was there a more personal connection? Someone who had reason to want to see Iva dead? Based on what little information exists in this case, it's truly hard to know one way or the other. There are far too many questions that would need answers before this crime could be analyzed in more depth with a chance of finding the truth. There's a slew of questions I wish we had answers to. Were any fingerprints found? Did anyone else have a key to the house? 
What was the situation with Iva and Herbert's wills? How much was their estate valued at? And was there ever someone police at least considered a person of interest? Unfortunately, until more evidence is released or new evidence is discovered, the murder of Iva Tice will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information on the murder of Iva Tice, the Morning Call newspaper has done the vast majority of the coverage. There are some discussions of the case online, but there's very little factual information that's ever been publicly released. There's also a Facebook page entitled Iva Kindred Tice Cold Case, but it was created less than a year ago by Iva's grandchildren and has very few posts. Hopefully, they'll be adding more as time goes on. If you have any information about the murder of Iva Tice, please contact the Allentown Police Department at 610-437-7753. You can also report tips to Pennsylvania Crime Stoppers by calling 1-800-4-PA-TIPS. That's 1-800-472-8477. You can also visit crimewatchpa.com slash crimestoppers. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at traceevpod, message me on Instagram at traceevidencepod, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, Aurora Kay, Bacon Bits the Cat, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Dave Allen, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eric Sumpter, Guillerme Pinto, Heather Louise, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kara Moreland, Marla Wright, Melissa Brakizen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levonen, Sarah Mascaratolo, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skeptko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, Tracy Woods, and Walter Jansen. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace evidence.com and click on the support option. That's going to conclude this week's episode. If you haven't already, please consider rating the show on Apple podcasts or wherever you listen. Five stars would be greatly appreciated, but it's up to you. Share these episodes, spread the word, and maybe together we can help bring justice to those who have been deprived of it. Thank you all once again for listening, supporting the show, and for being the best listeners a podcaster could ask for. Thank you again for listening to this episode, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.